So um, I'd like to invite you to start with to uh, participate in creating an image. So if you wouldn't mind closing your eyes for a second. And uh, just uh, be aware of where you're sitting, the place where you are. And imagine sitting behind you, your mother and your father, with their hands on your shoulders. And imagine behind them, your grandparents, four of them, with their hands equally on the shoulders of those of the lower generation. And behind them, your great-grandparents, eight of them. And going back still another generation, the 16 great-great-grandparents. 32 great-great-great-great-grandparents. 64, 128, 256, 512, 1,028, and so on. Each generation getting bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of the numbers of people to whom you're directly related. All the way back to the beginning of humankind, at which point you're related by blood to every single human being that has ever lived, and that is currently living. But the world didn't start with human beings, so we then have to begin to incorporate into our image animals, birds, insects, all living creatures. And in turn, before them, plants, trees, the grasses, water plants. And in turn before them, because the world didn't start with them either, we begin to incorporate the very rocks, rivers, mountains that form the earth and finally the earth itself. Something in the region of 4,600 million years ago which came into being. But the universe didn't start there, so we need to continue to go back and we need to incorporate into our image the stars, the galaxies, and ultimately the entire universe. Imagine a giant pyramid stretching back behind you, of which you're the pinnacle and of which the base is the totality of all that exists. And imagine that each of the lineages, the thousands and millions of lineages that branch fractally backwards towards that ultimate whole are lines of energy, lines of animating force that come from the universal all the way down through those lineages ultimately to come into you, animating you, bringing life to you, bringing connection to you, bringing the sense of your place in the whole, bringing your intimate and irrevocable relationship with all that exists. You can open your eyes. When we talk about uh, ancestral traditions, of which most pre-industrial traditions are, and certainly of which all the traditions of Southern Africa are, that image, in a sense, gives an, uh, an, a, a taste, an understanding, to some extent, uh, of what is meant by an ancestral lineage. An ancestral lineage is animate in its nature. It sees the universe as animate, that is, having life. So everything has life. Everything is alive. And to the extent that is every, everything is alive, we are also therefore in relationship with everything. We are relational 
and our universe is relational at its core. As Thomas Berry once said so beautifully, we are members of a universe which is ultimately a communion of subjects rather than a collection of objects as we tend to see it post-industrially. We have some difficulties presently. Uh, and a growing numbers of us are, are kind of feeling that. We feel a whole range of different things happening presently that are disturbing. We begin to wonder where our place in the world is. We begin to wonder what kind of a world we live in. We begin to wonder what the deep core meaning of our existence actually is. It's not that we haven't always wondered about the meaning of our lives and the meaning of the world, and it doesn't, isn't that we haven't always strived in some ways to find a way of understanding that. The difficulty we face now is that most of what we've learned in our strivings to understand our connection with all things, to understand the underlying purpose in our lives, to understand the core meaning of our existence, has been abandoned in the last 400 or so years. This time of uh, the industrial way of living has uh, reduced our sense of who we are and uh, of how we relate outwardly into our world to a very, very small component compared to what it once was. To that extent, there is a, I would suggest, starvation uh, of the soul that is happening presently, a malnutrition, which is resulting in a kind of internal retraction in all of us. And we can see that evidenced in what goes on in the world and the way we're becoming as human beings. We have, for example, the notion of cocooning, which I'm sure most of us here have heard of, where our lives are becoming more and more isolated as individuals. We begin to do most of our interacting in virtual reality as opposed to actual reality. Why is that? What's really happening? When, um, when we ask traditional people, traditional elders in Southern Africa, this question, one of the first things they say is that uh, the difficulty you face is the God you worship. And I, I, you, when you press them for that and say, what, what do you mean by that? And they say, well, the God you worship is a machine. Because everything you do, everything you are, everything, the whole way you operate as people is machine-like. And true to form, as with any god, it creates its creations in its own image. So a machine god creates machines. Now, we might laugh at that and think, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a sweet thought, but... What's the reality of that? But when we begin to examine the way we operate in our modern times, uh, some of that begins to start to make a certain amount of sense. When a, when a child is born, uh, in, inherently as far as our modern way of thinking is concerned, apart from the, you know, the adoration of its immediate family, it's basically useless. It's got all the potential, of course, but it's useless as it stands. So as soon as, as, soon as it's, it's old enough, it must, be, uh, it must be sent to an institution that makes it useful. Uh, and through its growing up years, it's programmed to become, as a machine should be, productive. So um, by the time we come out of school, uh, the, the mantra running through our minds, the, the, the core program running, 
in me says, how can I go out into the world and become productive? Because the validation that I seek within my heart, it seems, can only be found if I become productive. I self-evaluate in that way. I look at myself at the end of each day and I say, was today a productive day? And if it was, then it was a good day. And if it wasn't, then it wasn't a good day. And I ask myself why it wasn't a productive day and how I can change that tomorrow to become productive. And if I'm struck by some kind of illness or some kind of, some way in which I cannot be productive, that's, that's not just a, a simple little crisis, it's a huge crisis because suddenly the entire validation, the entire meaning that I have as a person in this world is threatened. If I'm not productive, I don't have a place in this world. And so we go through life. And by the way, machines, as we now know, more and more quickly, by the way, uh, become redundant. They have a sell-by date. So, you know, in a year, a cell phone is basically outdated and, you know, needs to be updated to a better one. And so it goes on. And as humans, we get to 65 and we're told, well, you're too old now. You know, you can't have a, a credit card because you're too old. You can't, you can't, you know, apply for a job because you're too old. I'm sorry, you sell by dates past. So, so, so we'll, we'll offer you, I don't know, you, you, maybe we, we'll create a home over here or something. Social security will give you a little bit to keep going. But basically, go somewhere and wait to die because that's really the deal. This is a terrible sickness at some level. For all the extraordinariness of our creativity, and we are extraordinary in the manner in which we're creative, in all that we've managed to achieve, nonetheless, uh, what we're doing in our freneticness to overcome the cycles of nature to try and fight the deep feeling of vulnerability we have in our hearts, which increases the more separated we become from that which nourishes the soul. The more empty we feel, the more frightened we feel. And we solve that by becoming more productive. Because if I'm more productive, hopefully I'll be worth something, and hopefully my life will be worth something. And hopefully then I'll feel better. I'll feel more ensouled. But it's an empty promise because the more productive we become as time goes by, the emptier we somehow feel. To the extent where depression and the feeling of emptiness seems to be the epidemic of the modern time. What do we do about this? How do we begin to grapple with this, this difficulty that we face? And, and what is it, why is this happening? What's happening? Well, traditional people say that inevitably, in the life of a person, we go through passages. So, well, the first passage we go through is birth. Uh, and then we go through several passages through the childhood period. And then we go through another major passage when we move from childhood to adulthood. And then another major passage when we move through midlife from adulthood to later adulthood, and finally, the enormous passage of death. These, pas these passages, as Jung would tell us, are ineluctable. They're, they're inevitable. We're going to go through them. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how glittering or marvelous our technology turns out to be. We're going to go through those passages. And those passages are going to have their way with us. The gods of the old times are still going to have their way with us in those passage times. One of the things that Jung was credited with saying was that in the modern times the gods have left Mount Olympus and have found themselves in the solar plexus. Okay. Hence our symptoms become the voice of the gods within us. And the gods will out. 
<laughs> so it doesn't matter how we try to overcome what we see as the depreciative, degrading, inevitable decline that the natural cycles of life appear to impose on us. We're going to go through the process of what being human means. Uh, and what being human means is as old as we are human, and a lot older, and isn't going to change. We may change in the manner in which we relate to it, that's evolution, but the, the nature of our process, its fundamental structure, the passages we go through from birth to death will always be the passages we go through from birth to death. The question we're faced with is how do we relate to those? Do we relate to them with horror when we reach midlife and we look around ourselves and we think, oh my goodness, the crest of the hill is reached and uh, the slippery slope to redundancy lies before me? Or are we going to begin to investigate the possibility that each of those passages is fundamental to a state of becoming? A state of becoming which we've generally peripherized ourselves from in the modern world. And we might ask ourselves, but no, okay, fine, but what's the blueprint for that? You know, how do we, how do we, rega if we had wisdom once, how do we, how do we reconnect with that? If, if we've lost track of something, what is it that we've lost track of and how do we, how do we regain that track? Traditional cultures, by which I mean pre-industrial cultures, and more specifically those that still remain in the world today, wherever I've gone seem fairly clear about this fact. The first being that we, we have, we've somehow gone off track as a humanity, and the second that that track can be regained. And the third that that track is regained by re-establishing a relationship with nature in its wild and unhumanly managed state. Thomas Berry again said that uh, the natural world could be seen in a sense as the primary text. which really implies that uh, everything that we are, at some level, in its healthy state, should be informed by nature in its natural state. Because at some level, nature in its natural state reflects the natural nature of who we are as human beings. That doesn't mean that we're not here to evolve as we have, we are, and we are, we're going through that. We're going through a passage at the present, I would suggest to you, and certainly that's what most of the indigenous elders I work with have said. Humanity is going through a passage, an evolutionary passage. And the nature of a passage is always an edge. In, uh, in the old days, in, um, when Southern Africa, when when boys went out into the wilderness for a period anything between six months and three years to become men, it was well understood that plus minus a third of those men would not come back. That's a lot of people. Uh, especially when you think that you know, the average in Southern Africa, or in, in Botswana particularly, the average initiation consisted of between three and 5,000 men from communities spread over a huge area, they would come together and they would go out into the wilderness to what was referred to as bush school. Buyale. Uh, and in that time, 
they, uh, they, well, the first thing that would happen, of course, was the un there was a simple understanding. You either come back as a man or you don't come back at all. You either evolve to the next level or it's over. And in a manner of speaking, elders tell us that that's where we're at as a, human be as, as a humanity presently. We're either going to make it through this passage or we ain't coming back. Uh, we're, we're out of it, so to speak. So, uh, what we're faced with, in a sense, is uh, the question of how, how do we get through this passage? What do we draw on to help us get through this time? And, and perhaps even the question, well, what are we, what are we bound for? What are we, what are we evolving into? The young boy going out into the bush doesn't know really where he's bound. He doesn't know what being a man means. He's seen other men in the village. He's seen the initiators who are men. He looks at their examples, but he doesn't know what being a man means. And he doesn't really truly understand in himself that this process is about becoming one of those. All he knows is this is something he has to go through. This is part of being human. It's a requisite of being part of his community and part of the whole scheme of things. That's all he really knows. And in a sense, we're in that same liminal space presently as a humanity. We, we, we don't know where we're bound, really. We know we're changing. We know we can't go back. To what we were. We can't go back pre-industrial. We can't become primal cultures again. There's 7.1 billion people in the world for a start. And the way of our living, the way of our existence has changed so fundamentally that the only way out is through, forward. And that requires us to begin the grappling with a dream that begins to shape a new future for us. And then we're faced with the question, well, what, what, what do we draw to fuel that dream? I mean, do we all go to sleep and kind of hope that some sort of image pops into our head that, you know, when we wake up we think, ah, oh, that's it, that's all we've got to go and do. Well, that's unlikely. But what we do know is that as human beings, going through transition is nothing new, either as a collective or as individuals. We've all gone through it over the millennia of being human and living in communities and over the course of our lives. However old we are, we've been through some major transitions, some passages. when we go out into the natural world uh, with this question of, uh, you know, what, what is the meaning of being human? I mean, imagine this. Imagine we go, we go out into the natural world and we, we find ourselves sitting under an oak tree here in the UK, somewhere in, in nature. And, you know, in the tree above us are, are two crows and they're having a conversation. Imagine we were able to understand them. Uh, and, and crow one says to crow two, you know what, last year I built, I built 250 nests. This year I'm aiming to build 300 nests, and, and next year it'll be five. And hopefully, you know, we'll expand as time goes by, and by the time I'm, you know, a fully grown crow, I'll be producing 10,000 nests a year. <laughs> we laugh. We laugh. <laughs> but, but when we self-evaluate, when we look at ourselves and when we differentiate ourselves as humans, suddenly that's the law by which we judge ourselves. That's the way in which we value our existence on this planet and the way we evaluate each other. How productive are you going to be? And if you're not going to be productive, I don't want you here. You have no value to me. Can you imagine how the soul retracts 
when, when, when that's the manner in which it's related to. It's a, it's a disaster. It's no wonder we feel empty and meaningless at the deeper levels of ourselves. The grail of our culture has become, I must produce because then I'll be loved. Then I'll feel as though my life has meaning. And so we go into this frenzy as a humanity. A frenzy that's sinking us under the debris along with the hubristic way of seeing ourselves that go with it. So, so we're faced with a conundrum. Um, the conundrum of how we relate to this transitory process we're in presently. How we survive it. And more importantly, what we draw on for that survival. You know, when, when a person goes through midlife in the modern world, certain inevitable things happen. Certain inevitable changes take place. The whole way in which we see ourselves as young adults and all the values associated with that, when we get to midlife, change. It's like the carpet is pulled out from underneath us. And, and we suddenly find ourselves thinking, well, what's happened? You know, I used to be so driven. I used to, I used to be so keen. I used to be so determined. I, used to, I, this is, I, you know, I wanted to go out and create an empire. And now I can't be bothered. I'm just not interested anymore. Now I want to write poetry. You know, and I want to become creative. And I want to go and do something meaningful in the world. Now I'm beginning to wonder who I am actually, and what all this frenetic activity was about. That change is inevitable. All of us, to some degree or other, in some way or other, go through that transformative process. The problem we face is that we live in a world that has absolutely no idea how to relate to that. You know, it looks at it and it says, oh my goodness, something's wrong. You know, you, you, you know, when, 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 when you sit in the MD's office and I say to the MD, you know, I, I, just, I, I just don't, I just can't do this anymore. And the MD says, well, perhaps you ought to go and see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. You know, they'll give you, a, they'll give you something. And then come back and see me on Monday morning and let's get on. And I mean, the first thing that happens to me is I feel completely unseen. I sit there and I think, I, I, obviously, the, you know, whatever's going on for me just has no place here. But well, the question is, where does it have place? The phenomenon of not understanding these things is a new thing, I suggest to you. You know, we, we did understand it. Our ancestors understood it. And uh, they had deeply incorporated within their cosmologies and not just within their cosmologies but within their fundamental way of living <coughs> methodologies and understandings and ways of living that held understandings of how to go through these passages what should happen when a baby is born what should happen for the mother and the baby after the birth in order to help integration what should happen when the child gets to the point where it needs to move from being a child to an adult? How does the community support that? How is it recognized? How is it integrated? How is it validated? How does the adult come back to the, the community and be seen by the rest of the community as having genuinely gone through something and be recognized that that change is fundamental to the workings of the community? It's not just something he went through or she went through personally. It's, it's a communal thing. It's communally sanctioned, supported, validated, understood. Equally, when that person gets to midlife, the same thing happens. It's understood. It's supported. It's validated by those who've gone through it themselves. 
by the communities who understand the value of those who've gone through that process and come out the other side as something different, with a function in their community that is fundamentally different. There were rituals, processes. There were ways of engaging with these passages that are inevitable in our lives, that were at all levels integrative. We knew this stuff. It doesn't matter what primal culture you go and talk to now, no matter how disarrayed they are, that knowledge is there. And it existed in our culture pre-industrially. And elders tell us in those cultures that it still exists in our culture, it's just that we're not listening to it. We're not availing ourselves of it. So, in, um, in southern Africa, you, you can, you, when, when you ask the question, so, so, so how, how do we avail ourselves? How do we avail ourselves of this deeper information that we have within us that uh, has evolved with us as human beings over all these thousands of years of becoming human? Millions of years, actually. Ultimately, I suppose, 13.8 billion years, if we go back, right back to the so-called Big Bang, according to our universe story. How do, how do we do that? What do we need to do to begin to re-engage with that knowledge which is innately in us, which is hardwired into us through our ancestry, through our evolutionary process? Well, the first thing is we have to have a relationship, a dynamic relationship, an ongoing relationship with nature in its wild state. In its wild state meaning we're not talking about nature you know, where we plant trees in rows uh, and ultimately the intent is to turn them into planks one day but while they're still trees we can kind of call them nature. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about nature living as nature lives. And we're talking about going into nature not with our caravan and our cold box and our television set and, and our binoculars and our list of animals that we're going to tick off. But vulnerable to and thus pervious to the relationship that we actually have with nature, with the natural world and with our own internal nature. Vulnerable to allowing a conversation between the deep nature within ourselves and its reflection in the natural world outside of ourselves. When that happens, we begin to relocate ourselves back into what I would say, or what elders would say in traditional cultures, as our primal truth. The real knowledge of who we are, as opposed to the distorted version that is trying to turn our psyche into planks and pieces of metal and... Uh, other mechanical objects which clatter and clang through this rather nightmarish existence that we tend to have. They also say that uh, there are two, two different conditions that, we, uh, that are kind of basic to being human. The one is a condition of vulnerability. The other is a condition of inadequacy. Vulnerability is the capacity within myself to, in a sense, disrobe myself of my defensive nature and allow myself to become pervious to something outside of myself which is potentially nurturing. Inadequacy does exactly the opposite. Inadequacy says, there's something inherently wrong with me and everything out there is going to take exception to that and therefore I must protect myself from it. So I retract, I close down. I thicken the walls of my perviousness. I become isolated. 
we see that in ourselves as, as self-consciousness, in a sense. You know, if you get a group of it's, it's, it's amazing because in Southern Africa, um, you know, there's a growing interest in people coming to, uh, to engage with, with what, they, what they're coming to understand as their own indigenous nature uh, by, by starting to uh, interact with traditional people and traditional ways and the wilderness and so on. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's quite a process because when people arrive, you know, they, they obviously have a certain expectation of what this is going to be like. And they arrive with their notebooks and their pens and, uh, you know, perhaps their tape recorders and their cameras and so on. Uh, and they're kind of looking around for the classroom or the conference room. Um, and uh, in many cases, what will happen is the, the traditional people will come and uh, they'll say, okay, well, now we're going to sing. And you'll see this terrible self-consciousness come over everybody and they'll say, well, sing? <laughs> I can't sing? What do you mean sing? Uh, that's not, I, you know, no, 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 no. I, 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 that's not something I can do. Uh, you, you would be very frightened if I started trying to sing. People will say, and they'll sort of make these, uh, you know, <laughs> frightened little jokes about themselves, self-deprecating. Your camera lens is going to crack, your recorder is going to disintegrate, <laughs> you're all going to fall down dead if I sing, <laughs> God forbid. We're very self-conscious. And, and, and it's interesting because I was sitting once in a situation like this, and I was among them, sitting there feeling deeply self-conscious. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the elder who was, who, was, uh, who was addressing us said, you know what, he said, you know, imagine this. You know, if you go into the natural world, if you go into nature, if you go into the wilderness in, in, in southern Africa, this is, and you're walking along and you hear behind a bush, a baboon muttering to itself. And it's saying, oh, bark? Me? No, 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 no. Imagine how embarrassing that would be. Or do you imagine the thunder hiding behind the clouds and saying, no, 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 no. I, I can't rumble and make any sound because somebody's going to laugh at me. Or a blackbird in a tree. Or any of the natural creatures that inhabit the... No. They do the exact opposite with all their heart. They sing. They proclaim themselves. And the act of proclaiming ourselves, say the traditions of Southern Africa, allows us to be seen. And when we're seen, the soul is validated. It's this fear of being seen that causes us to retract so desperately. It's this harsh judgment that if you're not producing enough planks, you're not worth anything. Forget your voice and forget any other proclamation you want to make. It's the planks I want to see. So, so that's self-consciousness. And that self-consciousness is, is, taking, is taking away what the Zulu people would refer to as our sidumo. Our sidumo is our noise. Our noise is drowned out by the clattering of machines. There's no human noise in that. It's the thunder of jets and the rumble of factories and the roar of cars on the highway and, you know, all that, which may have its own place, but where is the voice of us as human beings? It's no wonder we're all cowering under the tyranny, in a sense, of this machine proclaiming itself 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's getting all the attention because that's where the, the Sudumo is going. And ours is retracting smaller and smaller and smaller, and with it our soul is shriveling. And we're feeling less and less seen. And we're starving because of that. So say the elders of Southern Africa, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to start singing. We've got to do this thing. However self-conscious we feel about it, however the plank master tells us that it's a complete waste of time and totally unproductive, and however frivolous our modern technological world tends to see it, we have to sing. 
It's the medicine, it's one of the medicines of the soul. In addition to that, uh, at the same gathering, not only were we expected to sing, but lo and behold, we were expected to dance as well. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a group of Westerners, me included, being asked to dance. It's like, oh. Uh, well, I tell you what, let's turn the stereo on and turn it up very high and the lights down as low as we can. And as long as it's reasonably dark and there's lots of flashing, then you can't really see me dance. Then I'll maybe tentatively attempt a few moves. But don't ask me to dance in daylight. <laughs> because that's going to be very embarrassing indeed. Sing and dance at the same time, even worse. The second medicine, say the elders of the traditional cultures of Southern Africa, is dance. We have to dance. We have to dance. The body is made to do it. It's another way in which our sedumo, our, 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 our soul, proclaims itself through dance. We're seen. And when we're seen, we're validated. And when we're validated, we find our place in the grand scheme of things. That's why birds produce all these extraordinary colors and songs. We think, oh, that's just a mating ritual. Well, yeah, it is at some level. But also, you know, it's for everything. You know, it's so, it's so grand and spectacular in, in its nature that you can't help but see it and you can't help but be awed by it <coughs> at some level. You know, when the waterfall pours over the precipice and thunders thousands of meters into the valley, it's extraordinary. You know, the, the majesty of it is, that's a Duma. In the most radical sense of that word. That waterfall is validated, I can tell you. So, so the body is made to do that. Otherwise, what happens is we become increasingly stiff. And the, the, you know, the worst condition of us, us modern humans is that we're stiff and we're... You know, we've all got backache and we've got, you know, we're, we're kind of atrophying to some extent. We're atrophying in the juices of our self-consciousness. The acidity of it. <coughs> the, the third thing that uh, traditional people say in Southern Africa is that we have to believe, we have to accept, we have to assume we have to find a way of knowing deep in ourselves that there is something out there that is much, much bigger than we are. Call it a consciousness, call it a, call it God, call it creator, call it whatever you want. But whatever that thing is, it's huge. And we're a part of it. We're an inextricable part of it, and we're nurtured by it. We're given life by it. And that draws us into a sense of awe, and that sense of awe draws us into a state of prayer. Prayer being an expression of that awe. When we go into the natural world and we're truly pervious, we're instilled with that state of awe. The awe fills our hearts. And when it truly fills our hearts, we're in a state of prayer. And that's medicine for the soul. The soul lives, thrives on that. In every possible way imaginable. When we deny uh, our access to the Great One, to the all, to the universal, to the creator, to however we want to term that unnameable. Animation fills us. If we cut ourselves off from it through our self-consciousness, which leads to a feeling of inadequacy, which leads to a closing down, to a retracting of the self, away from life. We shrivel, the soul shrivels. And we start to feel the, the symptoms of that as anxiety, 
deep existential fear. We start to experience it as symptoms in our body. Crying for movement, crying for a sense of nourishment. And the sad part is that that which we so desperately need to be nourished by is absolutely all around us, in, un, in endless abundance. It's like being in a sea of water, fresh, delicious water, and having our mouths taped up so we can't drinking it and drink it and ultimately dying of dehydration. It's as absurd as that. So, we need to dance. We need to sing. We need to pray. We need also to perform sacred ritual, say the elders of Southern Africa. Sacred ritual is simply, ritual is differentiated from, say, the ritual of cleaning your teeth or, you know, cooking dinner each evening, which can also be sacred, by the way. Uh, but sacred ritual is an enactment of being human in the context of the recognition that we are part of something much bigger and that we are in commune with that. That really is the underpinning of sacred ritual from the Southern African perspective. And it's critical to the health of both our spirit and our soul. And from a Southern African point of view, I'll, I'll describe the differentiation between spirit and soul. Because they are, from that point of view, two different aspects of us. The spirit uh, is a quality rather than an entity, in the same way that the soul is a quality rather than an entity. The quality of spirit is an upward motion within me, the motion that seeks transcendence, the motion that seeks boundlessness, the motion that seeks to become part of the universal what Eastern people might refer to as enlightened, boundless, timeless. So the spirit is constantly trying to go up and over, to transcend, to go into that state of boundlessness, that enlightened place of universal beingness, if you like. The soul pulls in the opposite direction. The quality of soul goes downwards, and it says, I want to belong. I want to commit. I want to be part of a family. I want to be part of a community. I want to be part of people. I want to have deep relationship. I want to be part of nature. I want to be one with the tree. That's what soul's after. So soul is after a completely different, though related quality, because the two, while pulling in opposite directions, are deeply related to each other. If you turn spirit around, you get soul, and if you turn soul around, you get spirit. And they, they seemingly pull in opposite directions and they create a bit of a dilemma in us at some level because we think from one, position, one point of view, well, I want to follow my spiritual path and I, you know, I want to meditate and I want to become, I want to, I want to have these experiences of oneness and universal love and all these things. And then another part of us is saying, yeah, yeah, but I, I'd really like to go and sit by the fire with a few people and tell stories and, you know, get intimate and really have you know, a deep sense of connection. And the meditating part saying, well, no, but you can't do that. You know, we're off to transcend. So we have this, this pulling in us, this, this dilemma. And being human is always these dilemmas. You know, we, we're faced with polarities. Wanting to belong and wanting to be alone. Wanting to be free and wanting to be totally connected and relied upon. Wanting to be meaningful on the one hand and deeply earnest and, you know, have gravitas and on the other hand to be light and frivolous and joyful and full of the joys of innocent spring. So we have these polarities constantly pulling at us in different directions and we, we kind of, we think, well, you know, how do I reconcile this? You know, which way do I go? Do I become deeply spiritual and, and you know, find a monastery or, 
you know, do I go deeply into the family and my community and become embedded in that and at, at the expense of the other? What do I do? Um, Jung came up with a rather nice uh, perspective on that. He said, yeah, he, he agreed. He said, look, you know, being human is full of these polarities. But he said, uh, if we are truly able, and he said this was one of the, the fundaments of the individuating process to some extent, if we are able to sit in the fire of that polarity rather than scuttling to one side or the other, if we are able to incorporate both polarities, what will eventually happen is a transcendent third will emerge. A position in a triad where it's a combination of the two opposing, seemingly opposing forces at a new level of transcendence, a new way. The medicines that I described earlier, believe it or not, dance, song, prayer, sacred ritual, all help us to do just that, I suggest to you. But there aren't only four, there are five. And the fifth one is story. Story is vital to being human. It's absolutely, inextricably, and deeply a part of who we are. We always have a story, no matter what we're doing, no matter where we are in life, no matter what's happening, there's a story. And we recount that story as part of the way of being seen in the world. So we might ask ourselves, so what is the story of being a modern human in this modern world? And how do I, how do I tell that story? And how is that story witnessed? You know, our, our movie industry thrives on this notion that, that story is core to being human. Uh, and to an extent, the hungry soul rushes off to the movie house to live vicariously the life that it would so dearly like to live. The adventure of being the hero, of going out there and taking on life in the safety of the movie theater. But that's part of what story is. You know, story is that capacity to, in the womb of the community, venture out into the possibility of what we might be, of who we could be. It's that identification with the story that's important because that's an animating force to the soul. It's the soul being given a charge of a sort, being called. being drawn into a sense of something bigger in terms of the meaning of our existence. You know, and when we, when we face this issue of plank making, as I call it, uh, or, or perhaps you know, it's when I get up in the morning and I go off to the factory and I sit in front of a conveyor belt and I put bottle tops on bottles mechanically, and I get through each day living in the hopes that the weekend will come just that little bit faster because then I can have just a little bit of soul. And this is really the description of, of, of a lot of our existence, obviously in rather amplified form, but, but you know, it's, it's, it's that mechanical. It's that stripped of the wildness of who we are. The wildness being that animating expression of the soul. The soul that wants to dance, the soul that wants to sing, the soul that wants to tell its story epically, tectonically. The soul that wants to pray to something so much bigger. The soul that wants to search for the grail, the meaning of life itself. The vastness of this extraordinary experience of being alive.
So, so in this time, as, as human beings, in this time of transition that we're going through, which is, in a sense, a macrocosm of the microcosmic transitions that we go through as human beings, the traditional elders who specialize in such rites of passage in southern Africa say, if we incorporate in our relationship with the wild world of, the, of nature, those five medicines, those five practices, we will find the dream of where we're going, both as individuals and as a collective. We will find what this passage that we're going through is really about, and we will survive it. Not only will we survive it, but we will survive it at a completely different level. We will become something greater. And our world will be the greater for it in all its different aspects and with all with whom we share it. That, in traditional culture, is referred to as the call of the magician. The magician being the creative force within us that bubbles up from the soul into our everyday experience. The call of the magician is to engage with this passage of transformation and transition with all the tools we've been given, with all the tools that we've discovered as a humanity over the millennia, over the millions of years, in fact, of our evolutionary process. We've done this a lot before. Of course, we've never done it like this before because we've never been here before. And that's true of any passage. No matter whether it's a collective or an individual, we've never been there before. It's new, it's different. There are no maps. We have to begin the process of making our own, and that's the dream. The dream begins to form the potential of what we can become, what we can be, who we can become, and what we bring to this experience of life, to this process of living, to this existence, to the extraordinariness of being human. Instead of retracting into this terror of being human, thinking that we've become a complete abomination of the natural world, thinking that we barely deserve to exist because of the destruction we seem to be causing, thinking that our value is just, you know, we're some kind of disease spreading across the world. This is, this is what we're coming to think about ourselves. And the only reason for that is because we are losing the thread of what we really are, of who we really are. When we recognize that 13.8 billion years has been invested in us, for goodness sake, did 13.8 billion years of universal force invest all that energy in us. Believe me, thousands of other species have vanished and disappeared and haven't made it through their passage. But here we are, 13.8 billion years later. Did it invest all of that so that we can produce planks? <laughs> Do you think it has the slightest interest in that? The very fact that we were born is validation. If we can only realize that, this freneticism, this terror that drives us to ridiculous levels of productivity will cease. And when that happens, we will realize what it really means to be human. What all this investment was really about. That's why sages and prophets and all these people say to us over and over again, just sit in stillness for goodness sake. Stop doing Go and sit in nature. Find silence. And the moment you do that, you'll recognize the truth. But the fear is sitting behind us, goading us all the time. <laughs> you can't do that. You know, the wheels are going to come off if you try and do anything like that. You know, maybe, maybe we'll squeeze it in at the end of a productive day. 
you know, when I feel satiated at my productive levels, then I can go and sit and kind of think about a bit of silence. It's unlikely, however, because we'll be thinking about the productivity that needs to happen tomorrow morning when we wake up. We have no idea, or well, perhaps we do, but who we are is extraordinary. And what is happening now is extraordinary. If we realize it, if we really understand it, if we start drawing on those capacities within ourselves, that have been our tools ever since time immemorial, we will recognize what's going on. We'll recognize who we're becoming. We'll recognize the magnitude of this moment, this time. We'll recognize with ferocity the extraordinariness of being human. We'll unleash the true nature of who we are, which is wild. Wild in the very best sense of that word. Wildly creative, wildly passionate, wildly alive, rambunctiously capable, filled with capacity. 13.8 billion years of investment has gone into making sure of that. And that's offering us possibility. <laughs> the machine god is speaking. <laughs> Perhaps I've said enough. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask them. <laughs> <laughs>